Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, guess what, church? We're still here. Jesus has not come back yet. Yeah. Jesus hasn't come back yet. And uh, that means that there's, a, there's something that we should be doing while we're waiting. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. If you've been here, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually going to wrap up our little mini-series in this because we're going to get into Christmas messages. I love, I love celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ and looking back on that. So I'm going to start that next week. This is a really good time to, to bring people to church. Um, the, like, like our Christmas at Calvary, uh, this is an opportunity to build a bridge with people who wouldn't normally come to church. So utilize that tool, utilize that opportunity next week. But Sunday mornings, I'm going to tell why we celebrate Christmas and what Christmas is really all about for the next few weeks. Pray for me because usually pastors try to save as many Christmas sermons for all their years because, you know, there's, there's only so many you can write without repeating them over and over again. But, but God's been giving me some fresh uh, revelation, uh, nothing new in the scripture, but just basically uh, fresh perspectives and new, renewed perspectives of it. So I look forward to bring that up. So uh, we've been looking at signs and we've been you know, observing and then confirming that these things are really happening right now, right? And for me as a, as a dad and as a pastor and as a friend, as well um, as a husband, I want to be wise and I wanna make sure that I'm observing and then confirming them uh, for myself, but also for everyone around me and encouraging my friends in our church to do the same. And here's the thing, when we acknowledge that these signs are happening, we're acknowledging that the Bible is true because Jesus told us that these things would take place. One of the questions I had though uh, in this quick series that I wanted to do was what should the church be doing while we wait for the return of Christ? And so I wondered, what does the Bible say? What did the apostles tell the church while they were waiting? There's actually quite a bit. And uh, today I wanna give you some of those scriptures. I'm not gonna give you all of them. And, and I don't want this to come across like a checklist to keep you super busy until Jesus comes back, okay? It's, it's not about, now should we be busy with the Father's business like Jesus was? Yes, um, but what I'm saying is I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I don't want you to think that all these scriptures are a checklist and you gotta make sure you do them all perfectly. Uh, don't make this legalistic. When you see these scriptures, these are things that we naturally do because the Spirit of God lives in us and he enables us to live these out. Are you following me on that? Maybe it will make more sense as I read them to you as we go through them. Uh, but the Bible offers a lot of wisdom and direction on how we should live. And I even thought, what would I tell Calvary? And so, I, of course, I always go to the scripture to figure that out. So if you have your Bibles, you can use the screen as well. We're going to be in 1 John 2 to start with. This should get your attention. 1 John 2, 18 through 25. I'm also going to turn with you as well to 1 John, it's near the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter two, and we in verse 18. A warning about antichrists, plural. Not just one, but many. Dear children, the last hour is here. Now that's interesting, John uses the word hour instead of days. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches but they never really belonged with us, otherwise they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. So they were false believers and they turned their backs on the word of God, okay? But you are not like that, for the Holy One has given you his spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. The word Christ here means anointed one or Messiah. 
Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. So there you have it. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. There are religions who deny this. There are atheists who deny this. So technically, this is what the word antichrist means. It doesn't mean the antichrist in the end times. It means anyone against Christ. Simple as that. Anyone can be against Christ if they deny the deity of Jesus Christ and who his identity, who he is. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is the Antichrist, verse 23. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So when you see Jesus, when you have Jesus, you have God, okay? It's an important belief in the Christian faith. So, and here's our takeaway. Here's the bottom line. This is what John says. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in the fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. So John is saying, do not let any antichrist, any person who's against Jesus, doesn't believe in Jesus as the Son of God, to influence you and make you think that Jesus isn't the Messiah. Don't let them do that. Remain faithful to the good news. Remain faithful to the truth. Remain faithful to the word. Now, I believe that that's all of us, amen? We're gonna remain faithful. Now, here's the thing, though. I was at Caesar Rodney this past week in World Religions class, and I had many students try to question whether Jesus is the Son of God or not. So the belief is out there that Jesus isn't the Son of God, that Jesus isn't uh, um, in deity. He is not divine. He was maybe just a good prophet or a really good teacher with some signs and wonders, but he is not God the Father in the flesh. Whereas in Christmas, we celebrate that he's God in the flesh, born so that man no more may die, but that we would have everlasting life. So these are real teachings out there. They're gonna come against the church and John's saying, make sure you remain faithful to the word. First Peter uh, 1, 23 through 25, he says this, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. So remain faithful to the word of God. If we, if we um, abandon that, and believe in something else, here's the reality, it's gonna pass away with the destruction of earth. Whereas if we believe in the word of God, it will last forever. I would say remain with the word of God. What about James five? James talks about what to do. So the first thing is church remain faithful to the word. James gets into something as well. James chapter five, seven through nine. Dear brothers and sisters, dear church in other words, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Take courage, church. How about this? Don't grumble about each other. Well, that's random. <laughs> there must have been some grumbling in the church. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. There's that nearness of time. Time is short, and the judge is gonna be at the door soon, okay? What is the takeaway here? Patiently endure. If we were to keep reading in the context, we're gonna learn that it's not just about time, it's about enduring suffering and persecution as well. He goes on to talk about how the prophets were persecuted. Every prophet was persecuted for what they did and taught for God. And so he, James will go into that in the next few verses. So in context, the meaning of patience here is twofold. The fruit of patience in waiting and enduring trials or suffering here on earth. We are instructed to be patient in our interactions with all people 
<laughs> including us, each other in the church, and through times of difficulty and mistreatment. So Jesus hasn't come back yet. Be patient. Be patient through uh, with each other in the church and be patient with those who may be treating us, mistreating us wrong outside the church, amen? John, uh, James told the church, patiently endure until he comes back. Okay, and while you're waiting, don't grumble and don't cause issues within the body of Christ because the judge is at the door as well. Did you know that the church will be judged first? According to scripture, so you know what James is saying here is, he's saying, let's love each other, let's be holy, let's live the holy life with each other, treating each other right. You know, when we love each other, God's looking at us and he's, he's looking to see if we're living a holy life by the way we love each other. Our love is an expression of holiness. So when we treat each other with dignity and respect and not grumble, we're actually living out a holy life while we love people. Isn't that cool? It's beautiful. So... What about Peter? Peter goes on, and he, this is amazing. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time in this. I love this. Because the end is near, according to Peter here. By the way, this was 2,000 uh, years ago, and the end had not come yet still today. Isn't that wild? So they thought the end was here. Like, they were going through trials. They were going through the persecution that Jesus said that they would go through. And by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for persecution as a sign from when we get back to Acts series because a lot of persecution happens um, in the next few chapters of the book of Acts. But they're thinking, okay, any time now, Jesus could come back. Any time, his, his return is imminent, okay? We can't stop it, it could come at any moment. And so they're thinking this, and so Peter's like, let me make sure you know what to do. So I'm doing the same thing today, all right? And I'm gonna use scripture to do it. First Peter 4, 7. This is actually the, the NLT, and I'm gonna use the NIV for the rest. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Hmm. So praying, wherever you are, in your home, throughout the day, throughout your life, at church, in your groups, Praying is important until Jesus comes back. Now, I would say pray with purpose and don't give up praying. The NIV says this of the same verse, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. In other words, he's saying here, kind of in the Greek really, uh, keep your head and, and while you may be thinking about all that might happen, don't worry so much to the point that you don't pray anymore. Don't let all the stuff that's going on in the world overwhelm your head that you don't pray, you just worry all the time. Okay, and that happens, doesn't it? We can be so overwhelmed with everything going on and, and, and trying to worry our uh, situations into working out, which never works. Have you noticed that? You do all the worrying you can and it never works out still, all right? And Peter's saying here, no, keep your mind clear, have a sober mind. Even, even having a sober mind physically, not being drunk, so that you can pray clearly with your mind is, is invoked here, is, is implied here in the Greek. To have a clear mind emotionally, spiritually, physically, so that we can be intentionally praying. And the Greek word translated uh, near also means goal. So, for Peter's perspective, history has a specific end and goal. And here's what he's trying to say. The final judgment on all humanity and the final salvation of God's people when Jesus is revealed. So when he, when he says the end is near and so keep praying, he's saying there's a goal for the judgment of the world and the salvation of all his people. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to happen, that goal to happen, have an intentional prayer life with God. This verse has always encouraged me to actually write down my prayers and, and pray through them as well. Sometimes I don't and, and sometimes I do. I also have prayers that I have written that are like scripts, okay, not scripture. <laughs> okay, that wasn't me, that's the apostles, that's, that's the Lord but just scripts and templates for me to read to guide me, 
all right? That's how intentional I wanna be. And I've been growing and improving in that, um, writing down different prayers for different situations or different things, like for the church, for our family and whatnot. Now, here's the, here's the thing with that. When we get intentional like that, sometimes we make them heartless or robotic. So make sure that when you approach prayer, if you write down your prayers, uh, let's say you do a prayer list, um, and it's the same prayer list for a month, okay? Don't just fly through it, okay, here we go, we're gonna do the same thing I did yesterday. No, like put your heart into it and concentrate on what you're praying about, right, amen? amen. Don't let it become rote and routine that it loses the heart and the meaning for why you are praying. I think it's a great idea, I would encourage you to write down people's prayer needs that they're, they're giving you. Um, look back at how many, how many prayers were answered too, it's pretty neat. That's a way to be intentional in our prayer. Now, Peter's not done. He tells the church in verses uh, eight through 11 this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. There's that word again, grumbling. Each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Just, just let that soak in for a second. All right, use whatever gift you have received to serve others. By the way, every single one of you have received a gift from the Lord, a spiritual gift, as faithful stewards of God's grace. So God has given you a gift and you are a steward of it and you are to steward his grace. So you are a dispensary of grace from God. You, don't, you may not feel special today. I want you to know something. God has given you a gift to do his special work to express his grace to one another. How cool is that? And there's a variety of gifts, all right? If anyone speaks, he says, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Love covers over a multitude of sins first. He says that. What does that mean? Well, there's a few ways you can look at it. When we go after the lost and we help them be saved or when we go after a, a believer and help them no longer sin, like, you know, um, hold them accountable and help them not to, or if someone hurts you and you don't allow them to, or someone, someone says something offensive to you and you don't allow it to hurt you, your love covers over that, that sin. In other words, you're not easily offended. So it can mean all those things because James talks about that if you go after that wayward believer, you, you help uh, sins not just continue to spread. Right, if we go after the lost, we're helping the lost no longer sin anymore. So love helps cover over that. And then if in the church, you know, if, if, if someone is um, acting in the flesh and behaving more like their flesh instead of like Jesus, we don't let it so easily offend us. You know what I would encourage us to do? To become unoffendable. They don't realize what they said to you. Didn't Jesus do that? Father, forgive them for they do not realize or do not know what they are doing, right? And so there's, there's things that have been said to me about me or you or whatever, you've been through it, right? And you just go, it's all right. I'm gonna love them anyway, you know? So it's, it's, that's, what you, that's, what, that's what love does. Love covers over a multitude of sins. And not everyone is, is refined or not everyone is close to Jesus yet, right? Isn't that interesting now? Doesn't that sound like patience? Being patient with someone? And didn't James say to patiently endure or to not grumble with one another? So putting up with each other is like love covers over a multitude of sins. All right, yeah, does that sound okay? That sounds like a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Peter encourages showing sincere love in the first chapter. He says, show sincere love to each other. This is an interesting word. In, in Latin, I can't pronounce the name or the word, but it means without wax. And what they did was they made clay pots and they would 
put wax in the, in the cracks to fill the cracks. Um, and basically, they were disingenuous. They were saying, hey, it's a great pot, you know, buy it. But really, they put wax in it to seal any cracks so it wouldn't leak. So what people would do is they would take the, they would take the pot and they would raise it up to the sun, which, by the way, I think about Jesus. When we're before Jesus, the sun, the light of Christ will shine on us and show all our imperfections, right? And so they would raise this pot up and they would go, up, oh, no, nope, you put wax in that crack. I don't want that one. So to sincerely love someone is to love them without, you know, being deceiving. To genuinely love someone, to give them your truth, to give them the whole truth of who you are, to be sincere, to really love someone. Do you know that it takes time to know what that is too? It takes time to see love uh, shown and be committed. Um, it takes uh, serving others, being selfless in our serving one another. It's not about us when we love someone, it's about loving others, right? So the sincere love is selfless serving others and, and in the long haul, you're faithful. And that's how you can tell someone sincerely loves you. Isn't that why marriage is so beautiful? Because you love each other even with your faults <laughs> and those cracks in each other. It's so good. Generosity and hospitality. Show hospitality to one another. That's, and that's, part of the, that's one of the spiritual gifts. And he doesn't go into a lot of gifts here, but Paul goes into some more. Let me read the scripture to you. Romans 12, six through eight. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, what I'm doing right now, preaching and pro uh, proclaiming the word of God, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraged, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I'm not sure what your gift is. Here's how I found my gift, is by serving the Lord. And when I served the Lord, I got excited doing certain things. Now it doesn't mean that if, if my gift is prophesying, it doesn't mean that I don't lead, I can lead as well. It doesn't mean that I don't use my hands, I, I, it doesn't mean I don't give, I can give as well. But some of you are even more gifted at those abilities. In the Bible, that's what that talks about. Some of you have been graced with even better um, um, magnitude uh, with using those gifts, all right? And some of you wouldn't wanna be up here, right? Preaching. Maybe this isn't your gifting, but you know what? You show mercy or you show uh, giving or other things that, that I can't do the way you do it. You're so gentle in how you handle things and situations. So that's what God wants us to do is operate in the giftings that he's given us, but we also should try to live the whole 360 life as well in that. Now on the same subject of the church and how we should live, Hebrews 10, famous verse, I use it all the time, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Well, there we have it again. There is this teaching that the day of Christ's return is drawing near and we should not neglect being together as the church. Why? Because if we get together, we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And we can encourage each other. That's so important, isn't it? We need encouragement and we need to encourage others more than we realize. People don't even realize how much encouragement they need until they get around the body of Christ and they start hearing those encouraging words and they go whoa I needed this today I needed this you may not realize how encouraging you are until you get around someone who is discouraged and next thing you know it you're encouraging them amen what about spurring when you live close to God it inspires it spurs others 
to also live close to God. When you're doing good deeds and people see that and witness it, it also inspires them to do good deeds. That's why we're supposed to be together. But notice that you're not doing good deeds right now, so to say, like actively like serving, passing out food to the needy and stuff like that. And here's why I bring that up. All right, whatever it may be, it could be, you know, serve, well, you could be serving here on Sunday mornings. Thank you volunteers for serving. We appreciate that so much. But I bring this up to say, a lot of this happens outside of Sunday morning, doesn't it? That we inspire each other to, when we get together as a body of Christ more than just Sunday morning, we're inspiring each other and spurring one another on towards love and good deeds by the things we do, not just on Sunday morning. Now, are you inspired by one another's worship today? I know I was. It was beautiful. Praise the Lord. I felt the love of God in this place. I felt his presence in here. Uh, I, I want to thank you because I don't know if you realize how much um, pastors need encouragement and you've just been so faithful to encourage me uh, my first four years here as a lead pastor. And you may not realize how quickly pastors can get discouraged. And your, your, uh, your kind word or just the random comments I've gotten or the text messages or emails have gone further than you realize. And I just want to say thank you for that. It means a lot. But also, you know what else encourages me? Is watching your life. <laughs> when you go after God, like watching your faith in action is amazing. Watching you worship and hearing you worship, watching you serve and, and do the work of ministry. When I get to witness that, it's amazing. And I just want to say thank you for that because it encourages me as well. What am I saying here? I went long on 1 Peter 4, Hebrews 10, being together. Here's the bottom line, okay? Be an active and contributing member of the church. That's what they're saying. They're saying that as we wait for Jesus to return, be an active and contributing member to the church. Use your giftings to be an active, contributing member of the church. Sounds good, doesn't it? We need each other during these times. It's not gonna be easy as we wait. That's why, that's why James says patiently endure. It's not gonna be easy. All right, if you have your Bibles, go to 2 Peter chapter three. We're gonna be landing the plane here pretty soon. Coming to an end on this message. This scripture is really important. 2 Peter three, and uh, forgive me for not having the whole thing this morning. Um, I do want to start in the beginning, verse, verse 1. I originally just did 8 through 15. I changed my mind yesterday. Instead of giving you the context from my own paraphrasing, I want to read it to help you. Because Peter gives some excellent insight on how we should live. So there's three more things to cover in just this scripture alone, Okay. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking, sincere thinking, and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your, prophet, through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. What will they scoff? This is what he says, verse four. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. So they're basically saying, he hasn't come yet. Where is he? He's not coming. And they're, and they're jesting and they're joking and they're teasing. Okay? These are scoffers. And actually, they're trying to discourage the church. And so this is why Peter's writing them again. He says, they deliberately forget, here's his argument, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. He's saying, it's coming, okay? Okay. And by the way, this is the only place where the end of the world is mentioned where fire is going to destroy it in the New Testament is in this, in this um, scripture, in this chapter, all right? 
He's, he's saying, look, if he, if he did what he did earlier with the flood, he's got this. He's going to do this too. He's just not ready to do it yet. And here's where he says next, verse 8. But you, you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Now, some people take that literal. I don't know if you should necessarily do that. It's, this is a simile just basically saying that God is outside of time and space. He's an eternal God. And so for us, it may feel like a thousand years, but for God, it's only a day. Okay, it's an expression. Just basically saying, it, it, for God, this has been like a mist. The, the width of the palm of your hand for our lives, as the scripture says. To him, he's eternal God. So <laughs> he's not in the same time constraints as we are. We have finite minds, he has infinite mind, okay? So let's go on. Verse nine, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. He's not slacking or, or delaying on, perp, um, um, on accident or because he's not capable. Okay, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. That's, that's the mercy of, listen to that. Like you have this God who's storing up wrath and fire for the end, and at the same time, you have this merciful God that doesn't want anyone to perish. How beautiful is that? But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. There you go. There's our first point. Remove sinful living and put on Christ-like living. And he actually says it twice here in this, in this chapter. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth as he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, here it is again, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with wisdom God gave him. Wow, there you have it. The first thing he says is remove sinful things. Live a holy life. So Jesus hasn't come back yet. Don't live however you want. Live the way Christ wants you to live. Amen? Look at what Paul says too. Paul says something very similar in the book of Romans chapter 13. Okay, this love Love God and others. He's talking about loving God and loving others before this. This is all the more urgent right now that you love God, that you love others. All the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity, in immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Wow. That's how we should be living and waiting until he comes back. So we should be shedding the old man, taking that off and putting on the new man, Jesus Christ so that we are the bride waiting for the groom to come and take us to be with him, amen? That we are a spotless bride prepared for this marriage together with him in, in heaven. In this, in this chapter, in 2 Peter 3, he says, look forward or hurry that day along. How do believers hasten his return? Well, the godly lives of the Lord's people their praying and their witnessing helps bring others to repentance. Can we really hurry God along? <laughs> no, nah, it's gonna be up to him, right? But what he's saying is, why not, why not 
help the process, so to say, while we're here, don't live passively or just kind of lock yourself in the house or don't do any, don't, don't be the kind of person that's not doing anything for the Lord. Instead, let's hurry it along by living godly lives, praying for souls and helping people believe in Jesus Christ. That's how we hurry it along. That's how we, we are looking forward and we're attentive that he could come back any moment. And so we're actively uh, trying to help that process as well, even though in the end, it's gonna be whenever God wants us to, to be taken. And lastly, from this chapter, I believe that what we can learn from this is we need to remember the lost and reach them. The only reason God hasn't returned or Jesus hasn't returned and God hasn't sent his son is because the lost. Think about that for a moment. The only reason. It's not because of Christian suffering. It's because people are gonna go to hell forever. That's why he hasn't come back yet. Here's why. Here's why it's not because Christians are suffering that he's gonna rush back. Because he knows they have eternal freedom and joy forever. But those who don't have Jesus, they have suffering forever. That's why God hasn't come back yet. And it convicts me. It inspires me to pray for the lost and do something about it as much as I can to lead them to Jesus Christ. To do what I can, to do my part. Jude 23 says this, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. So go after the lost, just don't get into what they get into. Go after the lost. I wanna give you just real quick, just this simple way I do it. I pray for those around me. I build relationships with them. I invite the unchurched or unsaved to discover Jesus here at church or in, in weekly Bible study and, and reading. And by the way, how about this? If you're afraid to have a study because you don't feel like you're, you have enough knowledge or something, don't let that stop you though because there's a lot of great resources out there. But why not, why not just read the Bible with the lost? Why not just read the Bible? I was at Caesar, CR, let me get back to that. I was at CR doing the world religions class. Let me tell you something. I probably had about, about 80 students for the day. Three different classes, maybe even more. This generation is hungry for truth. And they're confused because there's so many different religions and different thinkings. And they kept asking the question, how do you know Christianity? You know, how did you land on Christianity? Why did you decide to choose Jesus? And does that mean all the other ones are off or wrong? You know how hard that is to answer that question? These are good questions. But you know what verse came to my mind? I didn't need to have like this brilliant argument. John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man shall see the Father except through me. That's Jesus Christ. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one, and that's Jesus. And, and they, they wanted to know, well, what about the Jews? They believe in your God. And, and what, about, what about Islam? Isn't that the same God as yours? And I, I said, not, no, not really. It's Muhammad's version of God. Okay, and the Jews don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the anointing one. The key is Jesus every time. Every time it's Jesus. And so I said, if you take anything from this class today, go read about Jesus and put your faith in him, not yourself or any other God. Put your faith in Jesus and you will have eternal life. I mean, I literally preached the gospel in a public school. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, here's the thing. I even got access to CR because I built a relationship with a teacher over 10 years ago, right? So pray, build relationships with people 
and invite them to Christmas at Calvary. Invite them to sit next to you. I see plenty of space next to our pews. People are hungry. This, this generation wants truth. It was interesting. At the end of this class, everyone's saying how much of Christian they are. They weren't saying it in the beginning. After they heard uh, someone bring truth and stand for the truth, all of a sudden they wanted to proclaim that they're a Christian in front of their friends. Because if we get together, we spur one another on as well. But it's, it's just interesting, by the way, and this is kind of sad at the same time, and I love this, this next generation, this young high school, you know, middle school generation, but they take everything almost hook, line, and sinker right away. Now, here's the thing. I told them, look, I'm going to go to my grave with this is the truth, okay? So what I'm giving you, I would die for, all right? I'm not lying to you. This is what I believe in everything, and I want you to receive this, but I can't force you to. So what I'm saying is, is do a, a come and see kind of thing with the lost. Come and see, you know, Jesus in the scriptures with me. You know, here, read this with me. Uh, come to church and come and see what we're, what we're all about. You know what I'm saying? Is that really all that hard? And if they say no, they say no, right? And we don't have to be worried or offended by that and we just continue to pray. So, all right, why don't we stand together as we close. Second Peter encourages us to throw off our sinful ways, put on. Isn't that cool that it's not about just not doing bad things, it's also doing what Christ says to do? Put on new life, all right? Look forward and hurry that day along and remember the lost and reach them. That's really important because sometimes we're trying to get all of our things in order, right? Uh, you know, let's, let's look at this scripture one more time here or just think about the scripture one more time. Every materialistic thing you own, if we were to take this literal, which I believe we should, is going to be destroyed. And this is a big teaching in this chapter I didn't get into today. But don't be materialistic is what it's trying to teach because all of it will burn. Store up treasures in heaven. What goes to heaven? people who believe. So while we're consumed with, and this is the problem sometimes with Christmas, and oh man, I gotta get off my soapbox, we're running out of time. But Christmas sometimes really just teaches a bunch of materialism, doesn't it? We need to be storing up treasures of life, people in heaven, and we're so consumed with the things of this world, we don't realize all this is gonna just be destroyed for the new heavens and the new earth. And we need to, to help people come to Christ. These scriptures, again, were not a, a list of chores for you to do. Let me read this part I wrote. When I hear of lies, I'm reminded to remain faithful to the word. That was the first one. When I find myself getting impatient, I'm reminded that Jesus, my great reward, is coming soon. Amen. When I find the world is heavy around me, I'm reminded to earnestly go to God in prayer. When, I'm, when I am with the church, I'm reminded to encourage and build you up. When I'm discouraged, I'm reminded to be with the Lord and to be with you so you can encourage me. When I see sin in my life, I'm reminded to repent and be holy for God is holy and to put on Jesus Christ. When I wonder why Jesus hasn't come back yet, I remember he's waiting for more to be saved. When I forget to see people's eternal destiny, I'm reminded that the gospel must be shared. See, this isn't a to-do list. These were just reminders from the apostles to the church. Sometimes they just needed a little refocusing of what matters the most while we wait for his return. Amen? Praise the Lord. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus through faith, we want to pray with you today. So I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up, and they're going to hang out after I pray. Um, and so I'm going to dismiss, but if you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for salvation, you need prayer for family, healing, whatever, our prayer team will be here ready to pray, all right? If you want to start a relationship with the Lord, don't leave this building today without doing that right here, right now. Amen, church? Wouldn't you agree? It's so important. Let's pray. Lord, 
We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the blessed hope of your return. There is hope. You are coming back for your church, your bride. In the meantime, your word guides us on how we should live. And Lord, I feel the urgency rising up through your spirit, the need for the lost to come to you. Time is short. The need for the church to purify itself, to purify ourselves from the busyness or the distractions and to make sure we're focused on you, that we're helping to hurry along this process, that we will be engaged, that we'll be an active contributing member, that we'll be in prayer. Lord, help us to live this way as we patiently endure and wait for your return. And God, for those who need you, whether it's in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces, in our community, I pray, God, that you would soften their hearts to receive our love, our invitations, Lord, and that they would receive our teaching of your word and that they would believe in Jesus Christ. God, thank you for this church. Thank you so much for how they care about what you care about. Help us to go in your power, in your presence through the Holy Spirit to be witnesses and to do your will here on earth as we wait. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>